Hello, my name is Carrie Monahan. I am the program director at the Sierra Fund and I am adjunct professor at California State University, Chico in the Department of Geological and Environmental Sciences. The challenge that I'm here to talk to you about today is none other than restoring salmon habitat in the Yuba River. Specifically, I want to provide you with new information about mercury and sediment removal that will make it feasible to restore longitudinal and lateral connectivity in the Yuba River. There's an unlimited opportunity to develop projects that restore the degradation that followed the California gold rush of the last century. There are thousands of abandoned mine lands in California, many of which have both physical and chemical hazards associated with them. Mercury was mined in the coast range and transported to the Sierra Nevada and used to aid in the recovery of fine grain gold from hard rock and hydraulic mine sites. More than 1.2 billion cubic meters of material was washed down the Yuba and Bear River watersheds from hydraulic mining. Soon after the discovery of gold in 1848, hydraulic mining was developed as a way to get fine grain gold out of the auriferous ancient river gravels. And to this day, these techniques are used in other parts of the world. There was about a 36 year period of unlicensed hydraulic mining, which ended in 1884 with Judge Lorenzo Sawyer's decision to stop hydraulic mining because of the impacts to downstream farms and farmers' livelihoods. Hydraulic mining was later allowed to resume in 1893 after nine years of legal battles and the California Debris Commission was created to license hydraulic mines that could prove that they had enough storage space to hold back the debris. This led to many debris control dams being built of all shapes and sizes, log crib dams to large cement structures. The last license was issued in 1950 by the California Debris Commission. It's estimated that more than 26 million pounds of mercury was brought to the Sierra Nevada to be used in gold recovery. Mercury amalgamates with gold, making it heavy and helping it settle out. This was a messy process. And though the miners tried to recover and reuse the mercury that they bought for their mine operations, it's estimated that there was a 10 to 30% loss rate to the environment. This problem was largely ignored over the past 30 years, in part because detection of low level mercuries that remain on these sites was not readily used, nor was it fully understood why low levels matter. Stated briefly, low levels of inorganic mercury matter because mercury can bioaccumulate and biomagnify in the food chain once it is methylated, which occurs when sulfur reducing and iron reducing bacteria are in anoxic environments and they use mercury as part of their metabolic processes in the absence of oxygen. The primary public health concern uh, is exposure to methylmercury through fish consumption. Another reason this problem has gone overlooked is that hydraulic mines are in the middle of nowhere. And as the forest grew back into their fire prone states, they were hard to see with aerial photography. With LIDAR, we can delineate hydraulic mines, which allows us to rank them and prioritize them for remediation. And the majority of them are on US Forest Service land. Notice the debris control dams holding back hydraulic mining debris in both the Horse Creek and Willow Creek watersheds. These have not been assessed for structural integrity for over 100 years. They are large concrete structures that block the longitudinal connectivity for resident salmonids. And mercury is still coming from these mine sites after rain events as particulate bound mercury or mercury associated with fine silts and clays. Addressing the ongoing sources of mercury in the headwaters is part of the headwater mercury source reduction strategy. This is a regional strategy to address legacy mercury contamination. It has four key targets with regards to mercury in the Sierra Nevada. The first is the sources, the hydraulic mines and mine features themselves. The second is mercury with respect to forest management. The third is mercury contaminated sediment that accumulates in reservoirs. And the fourth is reducing mercury exposure through risk communication. So where did all this hydraulic mining material go and what happened to it? The lower Cuba looks like this. It's a 10,000 acre area 
where more than a billion cubic yards or 760 million cubic meters of sediment was dredged. The lower Yuba is channelized in hydraulic mining debris, unable to access much of its floodplain. The reason this area looks the way it does is that it was worked and reworked by bucket line dredges from 1904 to 1968, where the debris was processed on a floating dredge and then replaced in the floodplain. Mercury was used in this process and we know very little about the role that mercury and methylmercury is playing in this area. The Yuba Dredge Company in Marysville had as many as 27 dredges, all greater than 100 feet in length, working at the same time, creating massive piles of tailings and inundating swales and ponds. The Yuba River has three forks, the North, Middle, and South Yuba. Right now, fish come up the Feather River and at certain flows, they cannot get past the Daguerre Dam on the lower Yuba. And at all flows, no anadromous fish can get past Inglebright Dam. Both of these structures were built as debris control structures for hydraulic mining to resume. Over the years, there have been many assessments of these structures, but for one reason or another, they have not been modified to allow fish passage. It's by looking at, looking at and understanding the historic context and current use that new opportunities can be found, specifically new understanding of mercury, reservoir sedimentation, and the growing cost of doing nothing. So to address longitudinal connectivity, we need to identify constraints in the Yuba River watershed. And starting from the downstream end of the system, we first look at Daguerre, and moving upstream, we look at Engelbright. To address lateral connectivity, we look at floodplain and habitat improvements, projects in the lower Yuba at Hallwood, um, are currently underway and later will be at Long Bar. Both floodplain restoration projects, both of these are floodplain restoration projects that recontour the floodplain for habitat and also create sellable sand and gravel. Similarly, there are upstream ecosystem restoration components such as forest health projects and mine remediation projects. The hydraulic mine remediation projects would reduce the amount of sediment and mercury coming down the system, and they will likely be components of any reservoir TMDL that the state develops for mercury. At the Sierra Fund, we've worked on reservoir maintenance projects, which involve sediment removal from mercury contaminated reservoirs. And we've worked on hydraulic mine remediation to reduce mercury and sediment loads. Daguerre Dam was originally designed to retain hydraulic mining debris it's 11 miles downstream of Inglebright, and it's about 24 feet high. Two fish ladders were constructed in 1937 that are not effective at all flows, nor for all species. Specifically, sturgeon cannot pass this structure. Daguerre is currently used to facilitate water diversions in the lower Yuba for agricultural purposes. This design would allow for fish passage at all flows for all species and would allow for the structure to still be a water diversion. This design was developed by Dennis Gaithard of Gaithard Engineering in 2014. This study was commissioned by NIMS. A fish ramp would be constructed on either the left or right bank out of the high energy flow path to reduce potential erosion during high flows. The fish ramp would be constructed using 100,000 cubic yards of base material well graded and stable after compaction. This material could come from sediment excavated from the Yuba gold fields upstream of Daguerre Point and from nearby quarries. A geotechnical liner would be placed beneath the upper layer of the river rock and the base of the ramp. Head gates at the top of the ramp could be used to restrict high flows. Inglebright is also a debris control dam and much larger. It was licensed by the California Debris Commission during the New Deal and built so that hydraulic mining could resume in the upper watershed. It was built in 1941. It's a 260 foot high dam and has 70,000 acre feet of water storage capacity. It is also about 25% full of sediment. Studies by USGS and others estimated that there's at least 29 million cubic yards of sediment accumul accumulated in the upper portions of this reservoir. Using this volume for a rough reservoir sedimentation rate, we can estimate that it would take about 183 years to be completely full. Picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, this is a 2002 picture of the confluence of the South Yuba with the main stem Yuba. You can see sediment moving down the system. 
Here is a 2018 aerial photo of the same area, and you can see the accumulation of sediment. The cost of doing nothing is increasing. What are the challenges to restoring longitudinal and lateral connectivity in the Yuba River? Well, by understanding the origins of the issues from the gold rush, and by understanding mercury fate and transport, we can offer new insights to these obstacles. The first step is to understanding mercury contamination issue. The first step to understanding the mercury contamination issue is the difference in regulation between mercury in water and mercury in sediment. The California Clean Water Act criteria for mercury in water is 50 nanograms per liter, parts per trillion, very low. The California EPA screening level for mercury in residential soil is 18 parts per million. Anything, meaning that anything less than 18 parts per million mercury is sufficient uh, to be considered residential soil. What does this mean? It means that particulate bound mercury is moving through the watershed every time it rains, when we have turbid water. It also means that efforts to remove sediment from the areas where it has accumulated, like in reservoirs, can be done in the dry or during periods of low water, which means that mercury contaminated sediment can be removed without causing a water quality concern. The Sierra Fund worked with Great Lakes Dredging Company to develop a preliminary feasibility study for sediment removal from Eagle Wright. Specifically, we looked at the opportunity to remove 17 million cubic yards of sediment using a dredge, which would allow the reservoir to be lowered and a fish ladder to be built, but still allow Eagle Wright to be used as an afterbay for New Bullard's Bar. This is the volume of sediment, the 17 million cubic yards of sediment that if removed would allow Englebright to be lowered for a fish ladder. It, it would also create sellable byproducts like gravel. The material would be pumped downstream in a steel pipe to the lower gold fields where it would be placed in a permanent confined placement area. Dredging 17 million cubic yards is one way to deal with the sediment. The other is to look for opportunities to remove it in the dry. Displayed in this graphic is a red line where the reservoir could be lowered to allow for a volitional fish ladder to be constructed. You can see that this exposes the sediment deposit in the upstream end of the impoundment, and then removal in the dry can be used and the river can work its way through this deposit to its original contour. Stabilization of the material on the banks is one option. So is removal in the wet prior to lowering the dam. Likely the best scenario is a phased approach using both techniques, both dredging in the wet when needed and removal in the dry when possible. The thing to remember here is that sediment will continue to move down the system with each storm event. And if we don't actively address this issue, Inglebright will fill up. Gaithard Engineering evaluated two different notching options, one to the 460 foot elevation and one to the 430 foot elevation. The 67 foot below the current spillway or the 460 foot elevation is the minimum elevation that would allow water to flow through the power tunnels. 97 feet below the current spillway at the 430 foot elevation would require modification of the nearest two power tunnel. And this lower elevation would not allow the water elevations to fluctuate because the spillway elevation and the intake tunnel elevation would limit that range. Depending on the elevation uh, that the dam was lowered to, the fish ladder would either be 170 or 260 feet in elevation. Longer ladders are generally considered more complex from a design standpoint. However, resting pools and other features can be designed into them. This ladder would have a 10% slope along the adjacent hillside following the contour of the right bank. This would be about a 1900 uh, foot long concrete ladder they could have resting pools every 50 feet of vertical elevation gain, and it could have a multi-use facility allowing for collecting, holding, and evaluating and tagging fish. Entrance of the ladder would start at the discharge of the Narrows 2 power plant to take advantage of the power tunnel flows, which could also be used as attraction flows. The ladder would penetrate the dam at the upstream end at a slightly higher elevation. Downstream migrants could be collected along the right bank of the reservoir and guided to the collection facility. But what about temperature? Is the reservoir too hot? 
The first step to understanding temperature is understanding space and time. Specifically, when do spring run Chinook return to this river and what are the temperatures at this time? So spring, spring, run, spring run Chinook return in mid to late May and fall run Chinook uh, peak months are mid-October and the beginning of November. These data indicate that the current reservoir surface temperature from March to May are between 55 and 63 degrees Fahrenheit. These data indicate that the current reservoir temperatures in the fall are between 53 and 62 degrees Fahrenheit. And what about temperature in the rest of the watershed? Well, Yuba River is a 1300 square mile watershed. It starts at 9,000 feet in elevation and extends to just 30 feet in elevation, where it joins the Feather River in Marysville, Yuba City area. Most habitat assessments consider the habitat on the middle Yuba and South Yuba, not the North Yuba, because of New Bullard's Bar, which serves as a flood control and power generation facility. The North Yuba subwatershed is about 490 square miles, Middle Yuba is 210 square miles. And a fish ladder at the Our House Dam uh, could also be modified or installed uh, for volitional fish passage, opening up the rest of the Middle Yuba watershed. And the South Yuba is about a 350 square foot, oh, excuse me, square mile watershed. So to understand temperature for spawning salmonids, uh, that they need is that they need to get to the upper reaches of the watershed where cool temperatures exist all year long and are appropriate for spawning. The better habitat assessments look at different reaches and when fish would be entering those reaches. This is a measure of weekly average temperatures from 2011. It indicates the spatial distribution of pools, which are important thermal refugia. You can see the cooler reaches for spawning are in the upper ends of the north and middle Yuba. To get there, fish would use pools as holding habitat. Any additional flows would only improve the temperature and extend these reaches and increase the number of pools that are suitable. So in general, this is what we've covered. We've talked about how inorganic particulate bound mercury is coming from hydraulic mine sites in the upper watershed and that source control is a necessary part, necessary part of the strategy to address legacy mercury contamination. We talked about how reservoirs are filling up with mercury contaminated sediment, but that removal in the dry is an effective way to remove mercury from the watershed without creating a water quality problem. And we address the temperature in the reservoir and in the upper reaches. From the Gaithard Engineering Report from 2014, he provides um, cost estimates for each of these activities and even schedules for construction. Uh, Daguerre would cost $18 million to modify, Englebright Notch would be about $23 million, and the Englebright Ladder about $37 million. So in all in all, we're talking about $78 million. These structure modifications would allow for volitional fish passage and not preclude their use as water supply and power infrastructure. Finally, uh, the Yuba is worth it, and doing nothing is really not an option. Uh, the Yuba River was designated as critical habitat for Spring Run Chinook in 2012. Uh, these modifications would open 60 to 150 miles of habitat for fall and Spring Run Chinook. Augmented flow increases the carrying capacity of the Middle Yuba to about 1,500 to 5,000 Spring Run Chinook and 2,500 steelhead. Lower Yuba restoration uh, can be done at a large scale for juvenile rearing and floodplain habitat improvement and coupled with sellable gravel. And also upper watershed restoration to address ongoing sources of mercury contamination. So what changed, why now? Well, mercury can be managed with removal in the dry. Dredging for sediment um, is also a possible way to remove sediment when you can't be removed in the dry. And really doing nothing isn't an option anymore. I'd like to invite you to join us in a workshop series in May, each Monday, um, for a couple hours to address due diligence in the gold country and methods for remediating California's Zipina non-lands, ways to increase the pace and scale, ways to conduct informed assessment, and ways that mining impacts project design and, permit and permitting. These are some of the critical references I used to put this presentation together.
and I want to thank you and um, open it up to questions.